So this is compost. We're gonna get into compost now. Just a quick definition of compost. Healthy aerobic compost is the oxidative decomposition of a variety of organic matter. The types of composting we're gonna to cover today, although there's more than just this, are thermal composting, which is also hot composting, or thermophilic. Static composting, which can be either hot or cold composting, and vermicompost. And this is the section where you guys probably know a lot of this. So ingredients we need are brown material or carbonaceous stuff that has a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's gonna be sticks, stalks, wood chips. I have sawdust on there, but uh, sawdust has like a 5,000, I think it is, 5,000 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. So it, although it, you would think that because it has so much surface area, it would be easier to break down. It has such a high, when you make it into sawdust, it makes it uh, even higher carbon to nitrogen ratio, so it takes that much longer to break down, actually. It's kind of weird. And then paper, cardboard, leaves, straws, anything that's stocky or sticky. And so the brown stuff that we put in a pile are gonna be more fungal foods, like I was saying, fungi, saprophytic fungi, eat away at things with more cellulose and lignin, so things that are stalks, sticks, leaves, are gonna be more food for the fungi. So, just a quick lesson. When you talk about plant succession or succession in the soil, if you were to go and till a piece of land and, or, or weed eat everything down or just take away all the vegetation on a piece of land, you're starting at the beginning of succession. And if you were to let that piece of land go and not do anything, it, not mow, not cut anything down, not treat it in any way, uh, if you've ever watched, like, driven by a lot that's like that, you can watch it slowly turn from you know, weeds to taller grasses to some shrubs and bushes and eventually, you know, like five or ten years down the road, you've got trees that are coming up and it's going to eventually turn into a forest. So that's succession. For those who have not studied succession, we've got pioneer weeds that start off at the beginning of succession. Then you've got grasses, taller grasses like prairie grasses, which row crops would be, most row crops would be in here like tomatoes, corn, uh, and then we move into uh, shrubs, uh, smaller trees, deciduous forests, coniferous forests. So as we're moving along in succession, we go from the very beginning of succession is bacterial dominated soils. The last part of succession when you've got deciduous and coniferous forests is fungally dominated soils. And in the middle where we would have like uh, prairie grasses and row crops and things like that are about one to one ratio of bacteria and fungi. The things that set biology back are gonna be tilling, compaction, and chemical use. So fungi grows throughout the ground, the soil in threads called hyphae, and they'll just be miles and miles of thread of hyphae, which builds on top of each other, then it's called mycelium. And if you can imagine having all these threads, if you were to take just regular thread and put it down through the ground and then you come along with a tiller and rip through that, all those threads are gonna be ripped apart and then you've killed all that fungi or at least set it back and made the soil bacterial dominant. When your soil is bacterial dominant, if you remember I said the first things that you get are pioneer weeds and then grasses. So anytime we do things like use chemicals or till or uh, cause compaction, hard compaction, we're setting our soils back in succession and actually setting ourselves up for weeds, if that makes sense. So my point in saying all that is that we're usually trying to make compost that has more fungi in it because we're wanting to get more fungi back into the soil and it's through using compost and uh, biology like compost and compost teas and then keeping that biology in the soil through cover crops and residue and mulches um, that we're gonna promote moving along our soils in succession and getting more fungi in the ground. So, uh, then we've got greens, which are a low carbon to nitrogen ratio, less than 30. So this is any plant matter that was cut green when you pull weeds out in your garden, those are gonna be green material. Food waste is gonna be green material. Um, coffee grounds. I've got hay under here. So this is a question that I've heard several times. 
hay and straw are the same exact plant, if you cut hay when it's green and called hay, it still has all the uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and sugars up in the plant, so it's a green material. But once you let it die and all those things have gone into the roots, then it's considered a brown material. So greens, uh, browns are fungal food, and then we've got greens, which are going to be more bacterial food. And then if you're doing thermal compost, you may or may not need a high nitrogen source, which are going to be manures or alfalfa. And if you're, make, if you're using a source of high nitrogen in your pile, you only want to add 10 to 20% of your total ingredients be high nitrogen. Otherwise, you're going to make your temperatures go way out of control. It's going to get really hot. So high nitrogen is what's going to get the party started with the biology and get, it's mainly bacteria. So the reason that, if you don't know, the main reason that compost piles heat up is because uh, with a mixture of carbon and nitrogen, the microbes are eating and reproducing and eating and reproducing. And just like all animals, when they eat and reproduce, it causes heat. And all that action, action, is uh, creating that heat to where we're getting the high temperatures. So the higher, temp the, the, the higher our temperatures go, the more decomposition and breakdown we're getting. So if you've got higher temperatures, you're getting faster decomposition and faster breakdown. If you needed more green, could you cut the grass and put it on right away while it's still green for that? Yeah. I don't like to use a lot of grass because when you put, you want to keep thin layers of grass. Um, it really holds the moisture and it, you'll get a little anaerobic pockets because it just doesn't breathe the way that it gets into a pile or you want to mix it in well right away if you're using grass. Uh, so a lot of people want to do, they like to call it vegan compost pile so they're not using any type of manure or animal product. And so if you wanted to not use any type of manure, you could use alfalfa. And I've used alfalfa with great results. I like using alfalfa. You just want to make sure that you've got decent alfalfa that has high enough nitrogen that you're going to get um, an increase in temperatures from the microbial action. And then uh, you want to beware if you're getting manures. I've never had any luck with horse manure. I just have not had luck getting temperatures with horse manure, even though people told me that their horses were not getting antibiotics. But you want to make sure that you're getting manure from animals that are not getting antibiotics. We're trying, bios is life. We're trying to grow life. Antibiotics is anti-life, so it's killing life, and that's working against what we're trying to do. You want to be fair, beware of like cattle, uh, like especially cattle and large feedlots are going to be getting fed um, diets that are high in salt. And like we discussed several minutes ago, lots of salt is going to be detrimental to microorganisms and have a bad effect on them. So we don't want anything from that. But uh, going out into a pasture and getting cow patties, that works great. And you're even normally getting red wigglers or manure worms in that. That helps you to get more decomposition working too. So with that too, if you're getting conventional alfalfa or other ingredients like straw, you have to be aware of residual herbicides. Um, a lot of straw nowadays is being treated with um, herbicides that are going to be residual. And even if it goes through the composting process, will have a bad effect on plants. That large scale compost company that I worked for um, was starting to have a lawsuit because of this. They had a batch that they didn't investigate their inputs and um, this guy had an organic farm and was having lots of leaf curl on his tomatoes shown right away and he knew what it was and some friends of uh, my friends of mine that have a farm right by there too are, were also having really bad time with compost that they got from them and lost like five thousand dollars worth of crops so it's a pretty big deal if you're selling compost yeah it's best to go with organic alfalfa if you can how does it compare to add pee to a compost? Oh, yes. Yeah. I've gotten questions about that before, too. I have done that. You just have to have a lot of pee. So the question, if anybody didn't hear, was about adding urine to a compost pile. And I've gone out and peed on my compost pile. But it's better to like have a bucket. Like if you were to have a family that pees in a bucket, so then you have a lot to add at one time. Yeah. So in that same note, like I'll clean up. There's a lady nearby that has alpacas, and she's got 
Um, that alpacas like to poop in a, as a group, they poop together. Uh, not, that came out weird. They don't poop together, they poop in the same spot. They don't all go at the same time. <laughs> this is gonna be a funny video. <laughs> uh, and I also get stable droppings, and in, a sta in stable droppings you're gonna get poop, plus urine-soaked hay or straw in there, so yeah, it, it's gonna be a high nitrogen source, yes. It's just harder to get that much pee, yeah, urine. You were specifically doing compost like to put around trees, like not for cover crops. Like, would you want more ground then because like that's the fungal food and you're trying to like nourish the roots of the trees? Correct, yeah. Yeah. Um, so most people, I can't remember if I, I think I get into it in the next slide. Uh, for ratios, it's good, you can go with like a 50 50 ratio, but. Um, yeah, I'm trying to do more like 60% brown, 40% green, or 60, 30, 10, 60 brown, 30 green, 10 high nitrogen. Um, it's, you can't really, it's hard to have like 70 to 75% brown stuff because the brown stuff takes longer to break down and so your compost is gonna take that much longer to break down. Do trees need some of the bacterial? Yeah, so bacteria, this is still being studied and needs a lot of more research, but bacteria and fungi work together. And I, I had a really cool article from when I was at Rodale that I can't find anymore, but it was like research that they had done that shows that bacteria use fungi as a bridge to connect like, I remember what it was microscopically, for them to like cross then. So they, they work together in different ways, yeah. Uh, is, it, is it true that if you use compost that's high in carbon nitrogen ratio, it actually takes the nitrogen away from the plants? That's been argued a lot lately. Um, I, I have no chemistry background, and I wish I had more of a chemistry background. And I, cannot, I can't explain the answer to her. Her question was about putting like wood chips or having more heavy brown material and having uh, that rob nitrogen from the soil if you were to add that to soil. Um, and uh, I wish I could remember, there's a good one or two podcasts that explain that better. I'm not, I'm not good at explaining that, but it has been found that no, that's not necessarily true that um, you're taking away any nitrogen because you're putting in brown stuff and they're working together that it's robbing the soil of nitrogen. I'm, but I, I'm not gonna even try and explain that because I don't wanna get it wrong. Is that why they say don't put fresh wood chips as mulch on your plants? That's what I've always understood why the people say that, yeah. I would just say that yes, but only on the surface of the soil. So just where they're, just where they're touching, you'll see a decrease in nitrogen. Um, I think most of the reason why people don't recommend wood chips on the vegetable garden, although a lot of people do do it, is that later when you want to mix or like expose soil for seeds or something like that, you're going to start mixing the wood chips into the soil and then you'll have more touching and more nitrogen being um, used up in decomposition. Yeah. So. Cool. Um, how much, if you're in a garden setting and you're pulling weeds, is it okay to leave a bunch of soil on the roots? before you compost it, or how bad is that to get tons of soil in your compost? It's not bad at all. Okay, it's okay. Yeah, okay. it's just that um, if you do that, I don't know if you've ever pulled a bunch of weed and had weeds and had soil left on it, then when you have a big pile, then it gets really heavy. Yeah. And so it's just a matter of dealing with the weight, but it's uh, completely fine. Uh, actually, it's one of the next slides that are coming up, I recommend putting forest soil, inoculating your pile with forest soil. I'll talk about it in a second here. Moving on with ingredients. So the, some of the most important things on top of the ingredients you have are gonna be air and water. So you want your compost to resemble a wrung out sponge or be at 50% moisture. Regular compost you want to be at 50% and we're gonna be talking about vermicompost later. In vermicompost you actually want to be at like 80% moisture. Vermicompost is gonna be worm composting. Yes sir. And then uh, there's a hand test method that you can do and I can show you how to do this when we go out to the pile here. 
where you reach in, you grab a handful of material and squeeze it. And if you squeeze it and have water coming out from between your fingers or have one or two drops coming out the bottom, that's about 50% moisture. There's a whole like scale of it, but I don't necessarily need to get into it all. But yeah, so as long as you've got water coming out between your fingers or a couple drops, if you've got a bunch of water, your pile's too wet and you would want to either spread all your material out. So say you had like a really heavy downpour on your compost that you just started and you didn't get it covered and it just like soaked your pile. You can spread all your material out in like, you know, four or six inch layer in your yard to let it dry out and then reassemble it in a couple days. Hopefully the sun comes out and dries it all out and the air. Um, or you can possibly add a few more wood chips to help soak up uh, any extra moisture or do both. And then uh, I mentioned the forest soil inoculum. So what I like to do when I'm starting a compost pile is I've got woods in my backyard or you can use public places. I don't want to promote going to a park. Um, but you know, like take a bucket and you just want to lift up the leaf litter layer and you'll see some sticks and leaves with white strands on there and that's mycelium from saprophytic fungi. And that, so this saprophytic fungi has been in the soil and it's moving up into the stalks and sticks and leaves that are on the, in the litter on the forest floor and it's slowly decomposing them. And so you want to get uh, a, like a little handful from here and I'll take a little bit of the soil and a little bit of a handful of the leaves and I don't want to take too much from one area so I'll take a little bit from here and I'll walk somewhere else and find some others and take a little bit from there. And I'm normally only like adding, I'll grab like a gallon of, of stuff to add to um, like a four by four by four pile, four foot cubed pile. So in doing that, you know that you're getting saprophytic fungi into your pile and you're also getting native microorganisms that are uh, used to your climate that are hopefully going to help take off more too in your compost pile. And it's good to do this at the beginning of the composting process in case you, in case there were to be anything in the soil that would be a pathogen, you're going to be putting it through the thermophilic phase where it's going to heat up and kill any pathogens or weed seeds. Here's another picture of saprophytic fungi. You got big wood chip there. These are all wood chips that are covered in mycelium. So I don't know how many of you are into the human microbiome, but that's been uh, in the news a lot in the past few years, promoting our microbiome through eating fermented foods and gut health and how our gut and our brain are connected. But um, in our stomach, we're actually, I heard that not too long ago, we're like 70 or 80 percent microbes. So like we're not just one thing, we're a huge super organism ourselves. And to digest food, we use bacteria and fungi in our gut, along with acids through saliva and stuff like that. And the same thing in, we're like a small microcosm of the forest in that the forest, like I said, has soil that's filled with bacteria and fungi. Those things are coming up and digesting things in the leaf litter from leaves, weeds, sticks, stalks, and a lot slower than our digestive system, but it's the same way that the forest is eating away at all that little stuff and then using those nutrients to provide for future growth. And so that saprophytic fungi is eating away at all this material and breaking it down and storing it within itself for then like when that microarthropod that I showed you a picture of, of comes along and eats it and poops it out and releases those nutrients in a plant soluble forms for the plant to take up. 